Okay, good morning everybody and welcome to the Standing Committee on Economic Development and Environment's uh, public briefing with uh, Tara X joining us this morning. Uh, we do have an agenda before us and so to get started I'll ask uh, uh, MLA O'Reilly to lead us in a prayer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, if you wish to provide, or, or sorry, if you wish to experience peace, provide peace for another. If you wish to know you are safe, cause another to know that they are safe. If you wish to understand seemingly incomprehensible things, help another to understand. If you wish to heal your own sadness or anger, seek to help heal the sadness or anger of another. Dalai Lama. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Next, we have review and adoption of the agenda. I'll note that we do have an in-camera item that's coming later in item five, and I'll seek a, a motion at that time. Um, declarations of conflicts of interest. Anything to declare from anybody uh, with us here today? Seeing none. Next, we have, of course, the public briefing. And uh, maybe what I'll do before we turn it over to you is I'll get uh, our members here to uh, introduce themselves. And I'll start over here to my far left. Hey, good morning. Welcome. I heard Nakamak from the Nakamak Ready. Good morning. Kieran Tester, member for Cam Lake. Far right. RJ Simpson, MLA Hay River North. Kevin O'Reilly, Free Lake. Julie Green, Yellow Knife Center. Danny McNeely, Satu Region. And I'm Corey Van Thine, MLA for Yellowknife North. And to my left, I have our research, our researcher, committee researcher, Alicia Tumshwitz. And to my right, our committee clerk, Mr. Michael Ball. So with that, maybe I'll turn it over to yourself, Mr. Campbell, for an uh, introduction of yourself and uh, Mr. Conley. And then you can head on with your presentation. Thank you. I'm uh, Joe Campbell. I'm CEO of uh, Terex Minerals. Uh, we have a project in the Yellowknife area, and this is uh, David Conley, who is our community liaison uh, for uh, Terex in Yellowknife. I'm David Conley. I'm the community liaison in Yellowknife and a uh, longtime northerner and formerly of your riding, Herbert. Okay, and um, just for your benefit and for ours, um, you won't have to do anything with your microphones. Just uh, direct the conversation, switching of conversation through me if, if David at any time or if Mr. Conley at any point is going to speak. And then just um, end your comment with thank you, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Conley will take that and I'll redirect. We'll redirect all conversation, please, through the chair for the purposes of, of recording this uh, public uh, briefing. Thank you. Over to you, uh, Mr. Campbell. Okay, well, I'm, I'll give a presentation today. This presentation is actually designed as a, a a community uh, information, uh, but it, I think it'll be good for this uh, committee also just to understand uh, what we're doing with this project. And of course, we're, we're exploring right in the Yellowknife area. And there's a cautionary statement in here. This is uh, what we have to do as a, a company, so I'll give you a few seconds to read that. Basically, it says that I can pretty much tell you anything I want. Um, I've put a uh, slide up here. This is from uh, presentations that we do for people uh, outside of the Yellowknife area when we go out to promote the company. Most importantly, in the on-site area, we have uh, myself and the VP of Exploration, Alan Sexton, who carries out most of the work here. Both of us are, are very experienced geologists. I'm aging myself a bit here, but I've got about 36 years of experience, and Al's got about 34. Um, we have an extensive northern experience. Uh, we've uh, worked on a major project in Nunavut called Meliadine uh, in the past. And we've also done uh, several years of work for the Kivalik Inuit Association. Our work with them is basically as a expert, uh, technical expert for environmental review of uh, uh, mining mm -hmm. projects. So we've, we've actually sat on the other side of the table in, uh, in uh, environmental review processes. I've just put up a slide of capital structure and it's not really to, uh, to promote the company, it's just to show that uh, we do have money in the bank. We have about eight and a half million uh, sitting in the bank right now. 
and we have an intention to spend about four and a half to five million over the next uh, four to six months on the project and we'll spend more than that for the remainder of the year. Uh, it's expected that by the spring of 2017 we'll be in a position to raise additional money to carry work forward. And this is, everybody knows where this is, so uh, our project is not any different than major goal projects in the rest of Canada, and that's something that we promote to people. Uh, Yellowknife is recognized as a major goal district, uh, and we've made it our job to try to uh, tie up as much of the area as possible. Uh, this is a strategy that uh, is used by many companies, but certainly Terrarex is probably the only one that's been able to tie up an entire belt on one of these major uh, gold uh, camps. This is a map I suppose is a lot of interest to people uh, today. Uh, we've staked up a, a huge amount of more ground in the area. Again, this is, area, this is areas that have been previously staked in the past and explored. We believe that we can do uh, modern exploration on them uh, to find deposits that have been missed. Uh, the areas that uh, we're in uh, or that we've recently staked include areas that had previous mining on them. Uh, the Burwash, the Tom, and the Ptarmigan were all uh, on the east side of the bay uh, and were uh, producers in the past. Uh, so this will add to the area that we will do exploration on. And I'll talk a little bit about what we intend to do in these areas um, so that people understand the process that we go through. This is just a map showing uh, the the geology in the area, we talk a lot about greenstone belt and when people look at these drawings they see green rocks and they think that's the greenstone, but actually the greenstone belt encompasses many rock types. Uh, so actually the whole swath of geology uh, on this uh, big map uh, is considered a greenstone belt and is obviously perspective for gold. All the red dots that you see on there are areas that uh, the government has identified as, as gold bearing. Uh, so you can see that uh, there's a lot of prospectivity in this area. And what we've done over the years, this, what's the property outline that you see on the map right there is sort of what we had in hand at the end of 2015. And then we began to stake further areas. This was a property south of Con that we staked. And then we began to pick up more and more ground as we saw the prospectivity of the area um, increase. And I'll give a little bit of a description of why this particular ground uh, is being explored. So this is a close-up of our property uh, as it stands today. Uh, and it's got a, a fairly complex geology map on there, so I'm not going to make everybody a, a geologist uh, during this presentation, but I just want to point out a few things here. One is if you go into these major camps, there's a thing called a major break. It's a fault that... Uh, is a, a, a focus for the gold mineralization. And if you're going to explore in these areas, you want to be uh, along that major break. We identified this break from uh, previous uh, uh, mapping that had been done on the property since the 1930s. And that's why we've begun to accumulate the property around this, this break. Traditionally, uh, people would look for gold mineralization in these green rocks. So Con and Giant were both in these rocks, and, uh, and that's been the case for all of the camps in Canada. But uh, in the last uh, couple of decades, people have begun to expand their search and have had great success in other camps looking for uh, ore deposits in other geology. And I've pointed out a few here. These yellow rocks are called Felsic Volcanics. We have a, a major discovery here called Sam Otto. It's in the Walsh Lake area. In addition, we have our Miss Pickle deposit, which is one of our newest discoveries, and it's in these gray rocks, and which is why we made the decision to go and stake this uh, new ground. And one reason why we quite aggressively stake this ground uh, in a large area of it is the mining industry is beginning to turn around. This area is starting to get interest from other people in the industry and we felt that we would rather be the ones that were exploring this area uh, rather than have somebody 
uh, common claim stake around us and take ground that we thought was perspective. Um, and so that's one of the main reasons why we staked the ground recently. We also are looking at areas out in these pink colored rocks. We have a, a discovery right in the granites, uh, which we're exploring. Uh, so basically all the rock types that you see in here are perspective uh, for geology. The main driving factor is that area proximal to what I called the main break. And we've had success. Uh, this is just a map showing some of the targets that we've drilled in the last little while. These are um, impressive uh, zones of mineralization uh, that uh, obviously uh, shows the success of the exploration that we've had. And these are just some sections through some of the areas. This is the mist pickle. It's a high grade, narrow vein, so similar to a pond style. This is the Sam Otto one that I spoke of uh, just a few minutes ago. It's a much broader zone of mineralization, uh, so these would be potentially uh, open pit uh, for these types of grades and widths. And, and these deposits can be quite large. And then we have new discoveries also. This is just a smattering of some of the surface sampling that we've done. This is actually relatively close to town uh, in areas that we've done some exploration, high grade results. Uh, so we have uh, lots of uh, areas to search for our next discovery. And of course, we stake the South Belt area. Um, essentially, we're going along the structures that were mined by Kahn. Uh, so we stake the land area first. And then just recently, we staked out into the bay. Uh, I think that bay staking was a bit of a surprise to people, but actually, uh, over the uh, years, hundreds of drill holes have been put out into that bay, and actually, there's quite extensive mineralized zones sitting out there. But the main reason we took that ground up, uh, the, the actual trend of the mineralization dips onto our land portion, and we were just looking for the surface expression of that uh, that mineralization. Just to make sure people understand where we are, uh, we're still entrenched into the exploration phase. Uh, typically for these types of mines, you're looking at a 10 to 17 year cycle to get to production. Uh, we're not uh, there yet. We feel that we're probably within 8 to 10 years before we're going to be able to uh, sort of look at a mine development. There's a lot of things that have to go into place here, not the least of which is, is uh, environmental assessment and environmental impact studies that have to be done as we move this forward. So right now it's just exploration, but to give a little bit more encouragement uh, for the economic side of things, we are getting to the point of resource to, uh, identification. We feel that by the end of 2017 we'll be able to put enough ounces up on the board that the project will start to show that it has the capacity uh, for economic development. But with that said, uh, these green areas are considered the higher risk area, and this is not risk to people or risk to environment, this is risk of failure. So we're still early stage and we could still have uh, Mother Nature could throw us a curve and, and we wouldn't find the resources that we think are there and the project ends. And that's still where we are, uh, but we're, as I said, we're getting into the resource to, uh, identification. The other side of that is the expenditure. So right now we're still at what would be considered low expenditure in terms of mine development. Uh, and what we would hope to do is to get to that bottom part of that triangle on the uh, left-hand side where you can be spending up in the billion, billion and a half range to develop a project. Just to touch on the new areas that we're going to be exploring, um, this is really grassroots. We don't have any specific targets on these new areas that, w that we've uh, staked. So it's going to be very grassroots type of exploration, remote sensing, uh, so you don't even touch the ground with that, uh, with those methods. And then mapping and, and uh, simple sampling of the rocks to see if we can identify some areas to explore. And for burr wash in the new south belt areas, we would expect that it'll be two to three years 
of that type of work before we look at advanced exploration. And of course, with advanced exploration, we begin to have some impacts on the ground. Uh, we're drilling, uh, so these require uh, permits to go ahead, and that's an, a reflection of the impacts that you have. Uh, you can't trench, uh, similar to that picture in the lower right, unless you have a, a permit to do so. So this is where we are with our North Belt property right now. We do have the permits in place uh, so we can drill and we can trench and we're developing ore resources as we move forward. And I've got a very colorful picture in the lower left-hand side there of one of the ore zones that we have uh, right now um, with some uh, high-grade mineralization associated with it. So that's the goal is to move that forward, but it just takes time. <clears throat> One of the things that we try to do is, is maintain a social license. That's kind of a, a catchphrase that the industry is, has put out. Uh, but really what it means is just being a good neighbor. So we try to continually have public awareness. So you've probably heard some of our radio ads. We have try to have meetings, which I'm having tonight for the public. We do paper, newspaper interviews and, and radio. Uh, we, we advertise our, on our activities. Uh, we try to show a preference for local and First Nation hiring and, and, uh, and use of services. Uh, local, we're doing quite well on that. First Nations, we're not. And I'll talk a little bit about that as, as I show you a slide of the expenditure. We look at monetary and in-kind support for recreational groups. So we sponsor a lot of things in the area. And again, just uh, trying to be a good neighbor. And, and of course, it's self-serving. It, it brings people uh, to us and, and gives them some trust, uh, but also it's just the right thing to do. Uh, we've organized uh, several training programs. Uh, this is to try to get people that are available to us as employees. We've also carried out educational visits to the drill sites uh, by various regulatory groups and, and government. Uh, we're working on getting some uh, schools involved. We're a really good project for, uh, say, middle, grade, uh, middle school kids to be able to come and, and see what the mining industry is like. We can take them out to a drill. We can take them to our core facility. And so we're trying to organize those things. We've also begun our baseline environmental and archaeological studies. We've done cooperative studies with the uh, university researchers and government that are at Giant Mine. And this is to try to give them a uh, uh, a, a, another area of the belt to compare against the contamination at the giant mine. Uh, and that's been very good for us also because we get very high quality studies done. Um, I've done briefings uh, to federal parliamentary committees, so similar to this committee here uh, for the chamber. And we try to maintain relationships with all levels of government uh, and, uh, and business leaders in the area. Uh, and again, just wanting to make sure that people understand who we are and what we intend to do. And here's just some, some happy pictures of things that we've tried to promote. This is one of our prospecting courses. This was taking the uh, Mackenzie Valley Land and Water Board out to our site. And this is a very, was a very important uh, visit. Um, the Mackenzie Valley Land and Water Board is who actually gives us our permits for, for drilling and, and advanced exploration. And in that picture there, probably two-thirds of the people had never seen a drill before. So it was very important for them to get out to the site because they can't really effectively uh, give permits for drilling if they've never actually seen a drill in operation. And again, this project is perfectly positioned to, uh, to do that. And we've done uh, a couple of more of these visits also uh, since this one. And right now, we're, we're, as I said, we sponsored and we've taken over the main sponsorship of the, uh, the Loppet in, in Yellowknife. The whole Loppet Trail uh, north of the city is within the mineral rights of Terex. So it was the proper thing for us to do. And we've been supporting that Loppet for the last three years. So to, just to talk a little bit about the expenditure, uh, in the last few years, the amount of money that we spent wouldn't have really raised many eyebrows. It was a million here, two million there. Uh, but last year, we actually ended up spending seven million. So we're re really starting to have a, a significant impact on the economy in the area. About five 
$5.3 million of that was spent within the city. Unfortunately, if you look at the right-hand side of this, only about two, 250000 of it went into First Nations, uh, both as direct employee and as services. And that's what we're trying hard to change. Um, it's difficult. Uh, it's not from lack of trying. It's, uh, uh, you know as well as I do, there's, there's just issues in, associated with bringing people in and, and, um, and getting them engaged in, in your programs. But we're still trying. Uh, just a chart on the, the expenditures so you get an idea where the project is going. So the solid line up to $7 million this year, we're intending to spend another $10 million uh, in uh, 2017. And this is our three-year budget. Uh, so at the bottom of this chart is $40 million. Uh, we've identified the areas that we want to work in. Uh, we've put expenditure towards that. Uh, I'll point out just on the other work activity, the $1.95 million, uh, most of that money is going to be spent uh, in this new area that we just staked. So this is this low impact uh, grassroots exploration that will be carried out in that area. Uh, the other major expenditure obviously is going to be drilling and that's on identified zones of, of mineralization. So. That's uh, sort of where we are right now, and you can see from that bottom number that uh, uh, we are starting now to really have a, a, a significant impact on the uh, economy in the area. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Thank Further you. to that, Mr. Yeah, Conley? Mr. Chair, thank you for recognizing me. There are just a few uh, areas that I wanted to highlight in which we have been working directly with uh, your government, the GNWT. Uh, <coughs> Keep in mind the goal is not a short-term mine, but a multi-generational mine that would be five over a number of generations and uh, provide for opportunities for sustainable em employment, training, therefore employment, and um, supporting the economy. So some of the activities uh, include a joint wind study, which we're undertaking uh, with the uh, Department of Public Works and with the hope that maybe that can get up to towards 5 percent of our requirement, but it's still very early um, ages, uh, stages. A joint interpretive uh, trail study that would see some of the early exploration trails uh, not only continue to be used for geological access and classroom access, but also interpretive trails that could be either used by our residents or our, our tourists. Um, we fund a co -user, trail co-user committee of, con, which consists of the six recreational groups that use a lot of the original exploration trails and we put the money in but they control the bank account and the uh, chairmanship of that. We, we attend the meetings. But the idea is safe co-usage of the hundreds of kilometers of exploration trails around the, uh, the city. Um, as uh, Mr. Campbell said, funding prospecting courses, including um, uh, uh, DLO data, of course, in, of course, in data as well, in partnership with your government and the uh, Mine Training Society. We've been very privileged to have taken advantage of the Mineral Incentive Program to introduce new technologies over the last four years, which in turn have uh, helped uh, give Joe confidence that there's uh, more gold left in those rocks than we're seeing under Old, older technologies. Um, we're working uh, with the school board. It's very important to find a appropriate place that going on a field trip is fun, but doesn't help people. It actually disturbs teachers' progress in getting through the curriculum, and unless the field trip, which exposes people to earth sciences, fits into the curriculum. So we're working with the Dilladet and Yellowknife boards to try to flush that uh, uh, out. Um, We've, uh, as Joe said, uh, the former Northwest, Northwest Tolls uh, unfortunately no longer funding the Loppet, so that it will become the Yellowknife Gold Loppet uh, as of this year, and we encourage people to uh, uh, come out. Um, we're working on a heritage project, uh, and we actually were hopeful that this was going to be over a lunch meeting. We funded Arctic uh, Sustainable Harvesting to create a 1930s a meal which reflects the uh, early uh, days of 
uh, prospectors and miners in the 30s. And that will be introduced instead of the Rotary Club tomorrow night. But we we'll always encourage people to uh, uh, come out and try it at the Rotary Club. Uh, as Joe said, it's been tough on the employment side. Even uh, we set up a temporary office in data in an attempt uh, to uh, increase local employment. We've met with the uh, uh, YKD event again yesterday. Um, it's proving to be a challenge. We continue to work really hard at it. Uh, we've been approached to help uh, begin uh, with a fundraiser for the hospital that would probably involve uh, activities um, on the land um, um, in the area of the United City Gold project and we continue to work with the United Way. So it's not much yet, but then we're not a producing company, but we're trying to be good residents. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. Okay, I'll turn it over to committee quickly at this time for questions, comments. Mr. Nakamayak. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, it looks like you're doing uh, a lot already in the, in the community um, from past exploration projects. I see that it is tough to to um, to compete with um, operating mines, you know, with indigenous uh, um, indigenous um, groups. But um, uh, what are, what else are you doing to market uh, indigenous employment in, in Yellowknife and in the region across the territory? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Connolly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we use posters, presentations, uh, training sessions in the uh, communities, both the Klicho and the uh, YKDFN uh, communities, because, of course, the Klicho claim extends in this area as well. Uh, CKLB, uh, both uh, several indigenous languages, the um, uh, Yellowknife newspaper, and CJCD, as well as in our meetings. Um, in the communities um, pushing it, uh, making the opportunities available. And we have, we have several long-term employees uh, that keep coming back for each drilling session, and that's encouraging. But we really would, you know, on previous projects, Joe's hit 35 percent, and we're not anywhere near there yet. Thank you. And now he's closed by saying thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Next, uh, further, Mr. Nakamayak. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, earlier on uh, in your presentation, you talked about uh, about working in, in the Kivalik region and as well looking at older um, projects like this that have been staked and probably drilled before. Are, are you um, do you have access to old core in, in each of the sites staked and or each of the land in each of the claims areas? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we do have uh, core from uh, some of the areas that we're exploring. Um, certainly, uh, our North Belt project, we were able to recover about 37,000 meters of core from the giant uh, core yard. There is some other core that's available to us uh, at the new um, government uh, core facility out by the airport. Unfortunately, uh, that facility isn't quite up and running yet, and that core hasn't uh, been taken out of pallets yet, so we, don't, we haven't had a look at it yet. We don't have any core from anything uh, in the con area, uh, but we do have records of all of the old drill uh, logs and assays. Uh, right now, we're working with a database of about 600,000 uh, assay samples from that uh, South Belt con area. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Further, Mr. Nakamayak? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, I, and that's, that's actually good to hear that you have at least some of this. Uh, you know, as, uh, as you know, like the, we're not quite a, a, as where the Yukon is with exploration, and, you know, and trying to rebuild this um, back to make it more user-friendly for exploration companies to come and use, which in turn will bring more dollars to the territory and more interest, you know, something that's more user-friendly will be um, will be more with more access and uh, I think um, broader legislation to bring um, programs like this out safely. Um, do you think it would be very helpful if, um, I know some of the countries are doing this, uh, like our friends in Greenland, uh, say when, when an exploration, when you've, you've restaked an area, you've made a claim there, um, I think having access to old sites and old records is very, very crucial to, to to, uh, to ensure that um, companies that may be looking for something else in the region have access to those, 
to uh, to core to uh, to the core samples and to the records. Uh, do you think that uh, what could be done to improve legislation to ensure that we have um, better access and better information to to uh, to staked areas like this? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Uh, that's a uh, a very good question. Um, one of the issues that we had when we first came to this project was a, was a lack of information. And the main reason for that is the areas that we work on are uh, mine leases. And there's no obligation to a company when they have a mine lease to actually um, put information into the public record. Um, that should change. There, there should be an obligation for information to go into the public record. And certainly for Terex's work, uh, we've retained every bit of core that we've drilled. We, we have a, a core storage facility out by the airport. Um, it's all detailed uh, where that material is and where it came from. And we've created a huge database now of the Yellowknife area uh, that obviously for, for company confidentiality reasons, we can't reveal all that information now, but certainly as the project moves forward and becomes more mature, it will be revealed. And a lot of our remote sensing that we've done, the airborne surveys, the topographic, which is called a LIDAR, it's a very detailed centimeter scale uh, topographic survey. Those surveys we've actually made available to the government. Uh, free of charge and also to uh, the uh, uh, Yellowknife Dene uh, also have all of those studies. So dissemination of information is very important. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Next I have Ms. Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I wonder if you could tell us how many people you employed in total in the NWT uh, last year and what your forecast is for this year. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I don't have an exact number uh, of what they are, but I can give you a, a, a rundown on the types of employment. Right now, uh, most of our uh, highly technical people, the, the geologists, uh, are not coming from the territory, and that's just because the capacity within the territory is not here. Um, the uh, as much of our uh, lower end labor, geotechs, uh, core cutters, uh, field hands are coming out of the, the territory. And certainly our service providers, uh, which are not direct employees, but they're here because we are here. So our drillers, the helicopter company, uh, the assay lab, um, if we added in all those uh, people, we would have had uh, about 50 people working on the project. Right now, with three drills running uh, north of the city, there's about 50 people involved in that work. Okay. Thank you. Further, Ms. Green? Uh, thank you. And what duration are those jobs, um, generally speaking? Thank you. Mr. Thank Campbell? You. Mr. Chair, uh, for a typical exploration project uh, that most people would be familiar with here, uh, the exploration phase is actually quite short. Uh, if you're in a remote area, typically you're looking at three to four months of, of work. This project has an advantage. We are essentially working all year round. We do campaign our work, but we would have about nine months of employment uh, out of every uh, 12 months uh, with small breaks for the Christmas period and the, uh, the spring break up. So that's another advantage with the project is we can actually provide fairly steady uh, employment for people uh, through the long term. Mm -hmm. Thank Just you. One more, please. Thank you. Further, Ms. Green? Uh, thank you. Um, what can the government do to help you employ more people from the First Nations? Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Cam or <laughs> Mr. Campbell? I might defer that to Mr. Conley because I don't have an answer for that question. Thank you. Mr. Conley? It's an extremely good question because we've racked our brain and worked really hard. And our challenge, I think, is one, determining if there are people who are unemployed, who are 
um, either available to work and want to work or are in working with third parties like the Mind Training Society, uh, we can augment the skill set so that they can safely come into the workplace and work culture. There, and, and that would be for the entry level jobs. Longer term, I think it's been noted that in our school system we don't teach geology. We have the Alberta curriculum and if anything it may focus a bit on oil and gas but rocks, uh, minerals are not a, a principal a career or whether it's in prospecting or whether it's in working in the drill site or a geotechnician or a geologist uh, isn't there. Um, so making uh, people understand that there are significant opportunities would help uh, as well. But that's, that's a longer term process. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Nothing further? No, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Next, I have Mr. O'Reilly. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I was very pleased to hear Mr. Campbell say that uh, um, he'd like to advocate for legislative changes to make sure that we retain more of the geoscience information from exploration. That's something I've long advocated in terms of uh, reducing environmental uh, disturbance. But I, I want to go to slide eight of the presentation, and I think it shows where the mineral claims are staked. And um, there's a couple of areas that are, are kind of curious in that they look like they've been excluded, and that's uh, the, the, the area where data is. doesn't look like that was staked up, which I think is a good thing. Uh, and then the area actually where the Burwash mine was located. So was that a conscious decision, or are those, were those uh, uh, subsurface areas actually withdrawn from staking? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Actually, it was a conscious decision not to, to stake underneath uh, DETA. Um, we had a meeting with them uh, yesterday, and I just used as a, a scenario, you know, what if we found a deposit sitting right underneath the, the uh, uh, chamber building in DETA? It would be very low probability that anybody would want to tear that building down and, and, uh, and have a you know, have a deposit. Uh, the Burwash area is actually already staked, so it's an area that we're interested in, but we don't control that ground. It's controlled by another group. There's a large block of ground in the middle of our, our claims uh, near the Tom and the Ptarmigan. Again, that's controlled by another group, uh, so we would be interested in that ground, but we, we don't have it right now. The other gaps that you see in our map are actually parts of the Acacio land withdrawal, and we just stay away from that area. Um, it's not a settled claim, so who actually will eventually end up with the rights to that area is unknown, so we just have to wait for that process to, to, to go through. Um, so uh, we do have sensitivity to uh, certainly populated areas. You can see that we haven't staked any claims over the center of Yellowknife either. Uh, and that's, again, a, a conscious decision. Uh, it's not that that ground isn't perspective. It just happens to be that there's 18,000 people living on top of it. Now, with that said, uh, I will say that there's a major mine in the Valdor area called Malartic. It's one of the largest producers. I think it is the largest producer in Canada right now. And they had to move about a third of the city uh, to put that pit in. So those things have been done. Um, but for a small company like Terex, uh, taking on that kind of a task is, is just beyond our capacity. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, um, Mr. Conley. If, if, if I might just supplement uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Campbell's comments. Um, there are other areas that uh, within the area claimed by Terex that indigenous groups have come to us and said are sensitive and we've given them our undertaking that we just wouldn't be doing any exploring there. So the Goodwin claims, for example, fall into that category. Thank you. Further, Mr. O'Reilly? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Yeah, one, one more. Um, look, I think you guys are doing a good job in terms of uh, uh, public engagement. 
uh, getting a social license and so on. Um, but clearly, uh, the areas that you have staked up, there's these these are areas that that are of a lot of interest to Yellowknifers, and I'm sure there's even recreational leases uh, in in this area. Um, what sort of uh, requirement is there to provide notice to uh, someone that has a recreational lease than you've staked underneath their their, their cabin, their, their their lease area? Um, uh, and I guess this gets to the, the heart of the, the, the issues around free entry, uh, our free entry system, and uh, our um, uh, which is something we're going to need to look at when we revise our uh, mining legislation or create a new Mineral Resources Act or whatever. But um, I don't think there's any obligations to notify uh, uh, someone if you stake underneath their property. Uh, I think you've uh, tried to avoid that in, in, from what I've heard. But uh, um, is any of the exploration that, that you've done uh, on, on any recreational leases, uh, any of the trails that you've had to build, and what sort of notice have you given? And, um, presumably things are working out okay. Thanks, Thank Mr. You. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, we do have to deal with, with recreational leases. Uh, the area that we're drilling in right now has uh, several uh, cabin owners. Uh, some of those are people that are on leases and some of those are, are, are people without leases or squatters. Um, what we've tried to do is to uh, not only talk to those people uh, publicly uh, in meetings like tonight, but also to approach them individually and, and let them know what we're doing. I think the, the greatest fear that people have when they see a big swath of ground like this staked is first off that we're somehow going to limit access and secondly that uh, tomorrow a bulldozer is going to show up on your front doorstep and those things don't happen. Um, it wouldn't happen for any company, but certainly not for Terex. Um, we've consciously created a uh, trail system for our work where we've allowed people to use our trails to show that there's no restriction of access into the area. The only areas that we've actually restricted is if we're physically have a drill in a particular area and there's a, a danger to the public if they get in close to that drill, then we'll make sure that that's signed and posted and, and we restrict people from going into that particular area. But, but that would be a very small uh, portion. The other thing that we try to do and we talked to the YKDFN about it yesterday was no fences are going to be put up and we don't have any right to do that. Uh, but as uh, Mr. O'Reilly pointed out, there is actually no obligation for us to inform people that we've picked up ground underneath their property. And in this case, and in every case, when people go out and stake, that's still the secretive part of our business. We don't show our hand of where we want to stake ground because it attracts competition, obviously. So in this case, we staked all this ground over a period of about six weeks and only revealed the ground that we had staked after we had secured it. Um, but there are things that we can do to alleviate concerns people have. Uh, in the case of, of the new Burwash area, which is definitely an area of keen interest to the YKDFN, they consider that their side of the bay, so to speak. What we've suggested to them is if we go out and do this LIDAR survey, which is a this highly sophisticated and accurate topographic survey, we'll give all that data to them because that data is incredibly useful for delineating watersheds or areas that have had past disturbance or where cabins are or even where somebody has pitched a tent will show up on these surveys. And so we'll make all that information available to them and that's again just to say we'll both have the same amount of information to look at and make the right decisions on where we how we should move it forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Chair, if I may add a brief Further to that, Mr. Conley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. Um, there are a couple areas uh, <coughs> relating to Mr. O'Reilly's question where I think there's an opportunity to collaborate and come out with mutually better results. 
Uh, Terex is required to engage. We've had about a thousand engagements over the last four years, some small, some some larger. But according to the engagement plan and requirements under the Mackenzie Valley Land and Water Board, there uh, is a requirement to uh, engage with uh, uh, stakeholders such as those persons who hold recreational leases and those who have, hold tourism uh, leases, both of which are granted by, or tourism licenses, both of which are granted by the GNWT. And for, uh, it was a surprise to me because in terms of my home, people can go to a registry and find out that I own a home or I own a car or any mineral claim. It's, it's all on a public registry maintained by government. The position of the GNWT is that the people who hold leases of uh, government land, so people who have the privilege of leasing that land, it's, uh, it's felt it would violate the confidentiality and privacy rights of those owners. So we cannot get access to who uh, has leases. The same is true with tourism licenses and where people may want to build or build structures or operate snowmobiles or, or snowshoe operations or ski, all of which you'd like to know so you can post and warn and communicate and coordinate with. And that too by the GNWT is held confidential, yet there is an obligation uh, under, under the um, uh, Mackenzie Valley process for us to engage with them. So the way we attempt to fill that obligation now is we provide notice to the GNWT and um, then ask if they will send it on to the list of people who hold recreational leases or who hold tourism um, um, leases. So it would be helpful uh, if those were actually a public registry in the same way that uh, home ownership and property ownership and car ownership and mineral rights ownership were on a public registry. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Next I have Mr. Testart. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to our witnesses today. Um, I appreciate the uh, the extensive um, focus you have on on developing and maintaining social license with our community. I think that um, that has uh, result that focus of your company and other operations has resulted in a climate where mining is very much supported by Northerners, and uh, I certainly appreciate that. Um, I also have questions about the uh, employment for local Indigenous hires and uh, how we can improve that. So you, you listed a number of joint projects you're working with various uh, groups on. Is one of those, have you, have you entered into um, any kind of relationship where you're trying to find ways to improve the um, labor market capacity of local Indigenous hires and um, finding ways to involve them in your project? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Connolly. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, one of the, uh, you know, is, uh, uh, perhaps when I, uh, one of the areas that we felt could, could work successfully are jobs which are close to being on the land jobs and within the economy. So econ but, but jobs which are both within the uh, money economy and take a lot of on the land skills. So prospector assistance and prospecting and field hands are one of those areas. So for three years now, we've run, I think, seven courses, um, including running them in uh, Indigenous, uh, our stakeholder Indigenous communities. So that, that's a significant um, effort that we've made. We're now trying to move into the uh, schools as well to say, okay, if we're not being successful, of uh, attracting people from the labor market or people who are now legally in the labor market by being an age that qualifies them, maybe we can affect their interest before they enter the, la the labor market. We've worked closely with the Mine Training Society uh, as well over the last uh, number of years as well as uh, ITI, the Mineral Resource Group, and trying to put on training programs. It, it's unclear to us what the actual number of people who are either in the labor market or near labor market. And that seems to be a very opaque uh, stat. And it might, <clears throat> and obviously people have a right to the privacy, uh, but it might be something where there's an ability to partnership with the GNWT with the willing First Nation um, and ourselves 
to, you know, is there a database of people who are not, uh, who want to work, uh, able to work, and are not gainfully employed already in the mineral or other industries? And that number might be surprisingly small um, because, you know, the mining industry talks among itself, and there's huge incentives to try for all of us to do better in our indigenous hire. And I think we're all struggling. So the question may be that there may not be that many people actively looking. Can we induce more looking? Can we take people from the not near labor market to, to the near labor market ready and then continue to work with them? But there's some big challenges there, and, and some of them I think the earlier committee was dealing with education. And I think some of those, do we make people aware of these opportunities and that there are on the land opportunities and on the earth science opportunities that can lead to careers. So we, we want to be part of it, but it seems to be a bigger problem, challenge, let me use the word, a bigger challenge than just us. But we're certainly here to be part of that solution as people get near labor market ready to then provide those opportunities to bring them in and take them from near to ready and then from employed to a career. And that's really the idea, multi-generational employment in a career in which you're secure, safe, well compensated, part of a team and move up step by step as, as your skill level increases. Thank you. Further to that, Mr. Campbell. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. One, one thing that we are going to try to do over the next, uh, the shorter term, and David's comments deal more with longer term, is there are activities where we can go to the First Nations to uh, help us out, and one of them is, is traditional knowledge studies, archaeological studies, and, and environmental studies. So we obviously have to do those, particularly as our work becomes more intense uh, and our area of, of uh, interest uh, increases. So those are all areas where we can bring in uh, people to uh, carry out uh, and help carry out those studies and we believe that that will give us another uh, path uh, to uh, find people who want to take part in the in the project. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. Tester. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I do appreciate, too, that Terex is um, um, a smaller company, so you can't do, you only have so many jobs to provide and so many resources to help um, get people into those jobs. And I do appreciate that. Um, Mr. Connolly mentioned the uh, working or communicating some of these concerns with ITA, with the Department of Industry, Tourism and Investment. Um, I'm just wondering if uh, uh, they've offered any solutions or to look into it or to work with um, the Department of Education, Culture, and Employment to try to identify some of that missing information or uh, perhaps in, uh, further develop the labor market. So has, has our, I guess, has our government been um, receptive to this issue and have they indicated anything to our witnesses that, w that uh, they are working on the problem? Thank, thank you. you. The challenge. Thank you. Mr. Connolly. Mr. Chair, thank you very much. In a very preliminary way, um, ITI has reached out to bring all the departments into a, at least once annual uh, briefing. Most of our educational activity has actually been through the various min uh, uh, the min mining st uh, development strategy. That having been said, we recently uh, started reaching out to the uh, school boards in impacted communities by two prongs, one dealing with the superintendent and assistant superintendents, and also the uh, curriculum personnel within ECE. And that's been in a development within the next the last two or three weeks. So we don't have any results of that. The desired outcome of that outreach is to find a time that is fits into the curriculum, so it's not, it's, it's a being supportive of the learning process, in which there's no snow on the ground, because you have to see the rocks that would involve a um, series of act, uh, learning activities that would include uh, working with our, our, some of our geologists are pretty good role models, coming out to the core processing, processing facility, going to the interpretive prospecting trail on uh, Rainy, uh, the Rainy Hill Trail, working with, uh, again, some of our prospectors are quite um, very good and excited about being role, role models and then also going to a, a drill site and 
we think that intervention level is going to be in the mid, uh, somewhere between grade six and grade eight. So there's been excitement by departments in that initial contact, but there's no results to report yet and no specific requests. But I would say generally overall, uh, most departments have been very supportive of our activities. The uh, one where we're still seeking to, uh, some more transparency on is there is, appears to be a recreational land management framework for which we've appeared in front of about between four and six times and, and made presentations oral and written, uh, particularly as it relates to land in which the GNWT has uh, sold tenure or license to uh, Terex, for which there's also appears to be some planning going on for um, additional, uh, how, how, to, how to, it would appear, how to deal with non-authorized occupants of the land, uh, which is the word for uh, some of us used to use that as squatters, and to accommodate the recognized additional demand for um, cabins and how that's going to work in with agriculture and power and uh, day use recreation people who don't have cabins and of course the mineral industry. And it's, that's been quite an opaque process to us, and, and that's one where uh, it would be good to have some feedback on. Thank you. Anything further, Mr. Testart? Interest of time. No, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any closing comments, Mr. Campbell? Uh, yes, I think it's important uh, since this committee has a, a uh, mandate for economic development. Um, one of the issues that we have brought forward to the ministers is the most important thing for bringing a project forward here is, is going to be power. Um, so that's an issue that uh, everybody should try to get their minds around. Uh, potentially a project of the size that we're envisaging would have as much power draw as the rest of the city of Yellowknife. So this is not an insignificant problem. It's, it's, a, it's a major hurdle uh, for what we're going to do uh, for a project. And traditionally in the mining industry, we throw up a diesel plant and away we go. Um, that would be a shame to do that in a, an urban environment where there may be other opportunities to have uh, greener uh, sources of power uh, that we could use. And what comes to mind right away for me, obviously, is, is hydro, uh, how that would work and how we could get hydro to the city at that level of capacity, I don't have a solution. Um, and there's other uh, opportunities that are being discussed right now, including LNG, um, which would be somewhat of an improvement, but still is using fossil fuel. Uh, so this is a, an issue that really uh, we have to try to bring to a head within the next four to five years. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Campbell and Mr. Conley for coming and presenting today. Uh, very informative. Um, we have uh, another presentation coming forward. This ends the uh, public portion of our agenda. And so uh, thank you once again. And uh, I'll ask the committee to uh, remain here for a moment. And, uh, and uh, just again want to thank you very much. And, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Thank you. Thank you.